Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Political Science Department's Election Roundup. I'm Daniel Klinghard, and I'll be moderating this event. Given the unique complexities of this election, we thought we needed to call on the full might of the department to rise like the Avengers to the challenge of making some sense of things uh, in this confusing and chaotic election season. So we have an all-star, all-specialty panel for you today, and we think it'll be an exciting, uh, exciting time. Before I begin, uh, let me thank my colleagues on the Holy Cross Elections Forum Program Committee. This event was the brainchild of that group, and it's really the last of many events that we've programmed together. I recognize some of you in the audience uh, have come to some of these other events. It's been a great bipartisan co collaboration. Uh, so I just want to say thanks to Marissa George, Tom Landy, Maria Rodriguez, uh, and Ben Tayeg for being such great collaborators and partners in this, in this work. Uh, Danielle Kane uh, of the McFarland Center, uh, who's hiding behind the McFarland Center logo there. Uh, I just want to say Danielle has been absolutely essential to this work, uh, and, and she's done a, a tremendous job. and She's been a great help to us, so thank you very much, uh, Danielle. Uh, first, a couple of words about the event. Um, this event is being recorded. Uh, I tell you that in part because that's uh, our, our legal obligation in the state of Massachusetts, but also just to let you know that if you speak, uh, you're gonna be recorded. If you don't wanna be recorded, you can mute your voice and mute your image and you'll be fine. Um, second, if you have questions, and I hope we will have questions. Uh, so we, we've, uh, we've asked the panelists to keep their remarks brief uh, so that we can give time for the audience to participate. If you have a question, could you just send me a note in the chat that you have a question and then I'll either call on you to ask the question so you can unmute yourself and turn on your video, or if you prefer to stay anonymous, I can ask your question for you. If you just let me know um, what you prefer. Now to our panel. Um, and panelists, uh, we can't uh, like give you a round of applause or have you stand up. So if you would please, when I call your name, just wave so people, uh, the panel panelists are all uh, on, on video. So uh, if you just wave when I call your name and I'm gonna go in alphabetical order. Um, uh, Nina Brzachka. Hello, everyone. Josh Boucher. Don Brand. Hello. Greg Burnett. Clayton Cleveland. Hello. Uh, Vicki Langer is not with us right now, but she's going to join us at 430 for her, her perspective, so we'll watch out for that. Maria Rodriguez. Uh, David Schaefer, has, has Professor Schaefer joined us? Do we have him yet? He will hopefully be joining us soon. Uh, and, and Samuel Stoddard, last but not least. Hi, guys. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to note that you could major in political science and not be able to take classes with all of these faculty members. So this is an amazing uh, opportunity for you uh, to, to, to get the, the full weight of the department here. We had hoped uh, to be joined uh, today by Jamie Hogue of the uh, Gov Office of Government and Community Relations, who's working with the Biden legal team in Pennsylvania, and with uh, Holy Cross alum Tim Rice, who's working with the Trump communications team in Pennsylvania. But both of them were detained by election business. And so we're hoping to be joined at, at 430 by Jake Molesky, uh, a class of 22 Holy Cross student who is working with the Biden campaign in Pennsylvania has been doing some, some interesting work there. So we're hoping to actually get you some breaking news uh, from the ground uh, in, in a critical state. So let's just start, uh, you know, the, what I asked the panelists to do was to just give us their perspective. And, and, you know, one of the great things I think about this is that we've got folks from a variety of different specialties, a variety of different expertises. Um, and so I'm just going to uh, turn it to you guys. Uh, give us uh, one takeaway or a couple of takeaways. Give us something that we, uh, the audience, should be, uh, should be thinking about this election right now. So, uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of different aspects to address here. Um, I can start by saying it looks like Biden won. Uh, and, and we can get into that if you want. Um, but basically the trend is that he's he's leading in enough states to win. And it seems like all of the outstanding ballots are mail-in ballots that are, are, are everywhere they're being counted are, are adding more to Biden's column than they are to Trump. Um, so I'd say he's gonna earn you know his 270 and it may end up being exactly 270, particularly if he doesn't have Pennsylvania. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, other things that I would mention, um, the polling was off again, even more so than it was in 2016. Uh, we can we can debate why that was, but um, so there were a lot of efforts to try to correct whatever was wrong in the, the kind of the weighting of the samples and the different polling methods. 
uh, between 2016 and 2020. Um, whatever adjustments were made didn't seem to solve the problem. The problem seems to have gotten worse. Uh, my analysis is basically that what's going on with polls is that there is a certain contingent of, of voters who support Trump um, who don't trust the media and don't have any, any interaction in any interest in participating in a poll. And so when they call them up, um, these people don't participate if you're a Trump supporter. And so this is why his, his support is being undercounted. I'm sure lots of efforts were made to basically look at different demographic characteristics and make sure, for example, that we had a larger portion of um, non-college educated whites included in polling samples this time. The problem is that there's something that is fundamentally different about, say, a, you know, an, a, an older non-college educated white, right? You, like, pick all your demographic categories. Um, one who supports, you know, a 55 year old, you know, middle income white man in a particular state one who supports Trump and somebody of the same demographics who doesn't, um, the, the, the Trump supporter is just, just less likely to want to interact with polling. And so um, that's going to be really, really hard to account for, right? There's, there's like an endogeneity problem when you're trying to control and the only variable that you have to, to try to account for somebody who's being undersampled is, is based on the outcome of the poll, right? So you, you can't, um, so, so that's an, an ongoing problem that'll be interesting to watch. Thanks, Sam. Don. Um, I guess I would just say, especially to our students, some for some of whom this might be the first presidential election you voted in, that uh, I sort of, uh, over the last couple of days, have had my faith in American politics renewed. I think it's uh, it's been an extraordinary uh, election, and uh, the turnout, uh, highest turnout since uh, 1900. Uh, we went up almost 20 million votes over the turnout in 2016. Uh, if, uh, you know, it, there has been a lot of concern expressed about voter suppression. All I can say is uh, somebody's doing a very poor job if they're trying to suppress votes because the big storyline here is, you know, uh, how engaged people have been. Uh, they've seen this as a consequential election, rightly so. Um, and, uh, and they turned out in, in absolutely record numbers. So that's inspiring, uh, as I think speaks to the vitality of our democratic system. Uh, a second way in which I think one might take some faith in this election in terms of the uh, uh, legitimacy of our uh, elections uh, is that uh, going all the way back to the primaries and determining the nominees of the party, one of the things we've repeatedly seen is that money does not control politics. Um, when you think of how much money Michael Bloomberg spent, Tom Steyer, uh, you know, there are Senate candidates, uh, Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, uh, almost $100 million in, uh, in, in uh, fundraising. Um, none of it uh, determined the outcome of an election. So uh, votes count. I'm not, I, we shouldn't swing all the way to the opposite extreme somehow and think that money is not a significant factor or doesn't have, uh, doesn't generate political power, but certainly there's been an overemphasis on the corruption of American politics caused by money. And, and I think we see that uh, that's really not true. Um, and, uh, you know, then um, the only other thing I guess I would say is that the election shows how closely divided we are uh, as a nation. Uh, I, and I think, you know, on the one hand, that need not cause despair. Uh, it presents opportunities for governance and it may lay a path uh, for governing uh, in the center. Uh, that would be especially the case if it turns out that Biden wins the presidency. I think Sam's probably right. Uh, he's on track to do so. Uh, but it looks like Republicans are going to hold the Senate um, based on the most recent uh, results that I've seen. Uh, and therefore, some kind of bipartisan cooperation will be required. Um, and uh, so I, all in all, I think a very good day for American politics, whether you won or whether your candidate won or lost, um, I'm very hopeful. Thank you, Don. Uh, just, just for the record, panelists, if, 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 can you raise your hand if you indicate you think that Biden has won this election? It, it seems like, yeah, right. I mean, it seems, it seems likely to me, but I, I'm just hesitant to, uh, you know, I, I'd rather let the votes be counted. Um, 
and and see where see what see what happens. Um, but I don't think it's anything that Sam or uh, you know Professor Stoddard or Professor Brand said is is wrong. It, everything I've seen from the margin in Michigan to the margin in Wisconsin and Wisconsin's fully in to where Arizona is with not all that much left to be counted to. Georgia, where Biden still has a chance to win um, based on the vote that's still not counted there. It just the, the, the president's path to reelection at this point is very, very slim and would require really strange results in the votes that are outstanding. So um, I, I, I'd wait to say it for sure, but I, I certainly think that seems right. Yeah. Um, just building off uh, Professor Brand's point about voter turnout in the election, um, it's interesting that despite this huge, these, these huge margins of voters turning out, the fact that uh, no matter what happens, that Joe Biden has won more votes than Obama did in 2008, that the election still falls to just three states where both campaigns spent uh, most of their time in their campaign rallies. And I think it really says something about our uh, electoral system and how it works and how it sort of funnels uh, campaigns to just a few states over and over and over again. And, uh, and I, want, I want us to wonder uh, how those voters in those states influence those campaigns and how they would govern, um, just despite the fact that you, know, you have almost 150 million people voting one way or the other. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Maria. Um, not detracting from uh, the positive uh, and encouraging picture of Professor Brand, um, I will be the voice of um, pessimism. What I see is um, two things, the two takeaways. One, maybe looking at how other people count votes, other nations count votes, may be a good idea. Not surprisingly, I am a comparativist. Um, but. It, 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 it is disturbing that the most powerful nation on the face of the earth has to take more than an hour to come up with results. So that's number one. No offense, but it is disturbing. The second one, again, from my field of expertise, nation state. We speak very little about the nation state in other subfields. Political science is very segmented, but nation state. And what I see is not only a uh, country divided, but perhaps two nations. And it's not clear to me that one belongs with the other, that one includes the other. Um, this is becoming a gigantic problem all over the world. But when I mean, what, I, what we mean by nation is this notion of what it means to be American. The, the vision of what the United States is. And these visions seem to be further and further apart um, uh, at all levels. So when, when you ask yourself, what it means to me to be American? Who belongs in the United States alongside with me? Who do I recognize as truly Americans that share the same values I share? I find you know, at least two versions of that. And that is problematic also at the level of the state, right? The nation states should roughly coincide nation, who we are with the state, that entity that govern us and that we recognize as an authority. Well, even our vi visions of the state have split. So there's one group that feels that the state must provide health must provide social services. And yet that same state has, should have nothing to do with security. So abolish ICE, defund the police. And then the other side, when it looks at the state, distorts it and, and destroys the recognition and the legitimacy that the state has to provide social services while enshrining the security apparatus. So, it is very disturbing from a comparativist point of view that the, the map that we're seeing and that, that setting. So I'm sorry to be the pessimistic voice. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Clayton. A couple of thoughts about this that are, I think, in some similar ways to the way Professor Rodriguez is, is 
talking about this, a little pessimistic in a sense. And I'd like to actually talk about the, uh, make some points about the foreign relations that this has and the impact that it has on American foreign policy and divide it up between the idea about the impact of the process itself from the impact about the substance of what the outcome of the election is. And to build upon what Professor Rodriguez said about the issues about the United States being a powerful state and having this kind of election issue. And we haven't actually seen some of the fallout of this yet because we're gonna see a contested election. And I know that President Trump has already put forward that he's going to contest what's going on with Wisconsin, what's gonna happen in Michigan, Arizona and others. But the messier this gets, the more there's going to be some ammunition for authoritarian states who may be taking actions and try to think about trying to achieve things against the interests of the United States. So on the process side, I think it actually has some impact about the way the United States is perceived by others. On the substance side, I think that this actually has a little bit of an impact around the way that American traditional allies have the relations with the United States. And in particular, there's a reaction I saw from France, which I think mirrors and it's going to be paralleled by others, which is that regardless of the outcome, they're just kind of set themselves up for going it alone. They're not going to look at the United States as a reliable ally. And that this is just another oscillation in American foreign policy that we go back from party to party. And as we change in party, there's just a huge swing in the kind of foreign policy that the United States puts forward, making the United States no longer a reliable ally. And so I am going to, you know, I share with the same kind of pessimistic kind of view, despite some of the uh, other internal side of the election that might be a little bit more positive and suggest that there are going to be some serious fallout from this that we're going to have to contend with from years to come. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, Nina. I'm going to echo uh, the uh, some of the, the sentiment of Professor Rodriguez um, and um, uh, as well as a comparativist. Um, so I spent some time this morning looking at how different European countries have uh, responded to this issue. Um, and uh, the one thing that, um, and there's quite a lot of variation among the responses. In general, um, um, there's been, um, uh, you know, all the countries are responding cautiously. Uh, the UK, for instance, um, has said that they're not going to comment as of this morning that on the because they do not, by definition, comment on the democratic processes in uh, friend, you know, countries that are allies. Uh, that was uh, Boris Johnson's uh, statement. Um, and um, but Dominic Robb has actually said that it would take a long time that for for the result that it would take and I quote days rather than hours. Um, um, Russia, uh, a couple of things. Um, um, again, the Russian government hasn't commented as uh, on this issue, but um, Konstantin Kosachev, who is a Putin ally who chairs the Foreign Affairs Committee, has suggested that. Um, R Moscow would like to see a clear victory for one candidate or another in order to clear its name. Um, um, so, so that it would, uh, the accusations for interference would stop. Um, it seems to me that Germany is the one country that has responded uh, sort of um, uh, with most caution and kind of their response seems to be um, um, a little, a little less diplomatic. Uh, the um, Anna Gret Kampf, uh, Karen Bauer, the defense minister, uh, has said, and I quote: um, "She has called that the the situation with the uncertainty of the election is a very explosive situation." Um, and then the battle for the legitimacy of the result, uh, whatever the outcome has begun, uh, has begun. So uh, in Germany, there's a very big concern about. Um, um, the uh, the comments that Trump has made. Um, similarly, uh, certain European Union um, officials uh, have spoken on this issue. Uh, the uh, leader of the European People's Party in the European Parliament um, has warned of the deep polarization. Uh, so in Western Europe, you know, the stakes are really high uh, because uh, clearly uh, there's going to be um, 
whoever gets elected is going to affect the transatlantic relationship. It's going to attack, affect um, concerns that uh, Euro Western Europeans have with um, Russia um, as a, re you know, trying to assert its um, position in Europe. Um, also with Turkey. So the, the whole fate of, the, of, of NATO is uh, at stake. Um, France, uh, again, uh, has um, both, uh, both the French, uh, French politicians as well as some EU officials are saying uh, that um, basically um, um, the Europeans have to be prepared to go it alone. I think France also has um, kind of incentive uh, you know, historically, if we look at uh, French foreign policy under de Gaulle, uh, uh, France, on one hand, um, would prefer the, uh, you know, US to be a, an ally. But on the other hand, I think uh, the French may be viewing this as an opportunity for France to step up its leadership position in Europe and to kind of reassert itself as a re uh, reassert France as a regional power. Um, and in the Central and Eastern Europe, I think uh, the situation is much more complex. Again, it depends on uh, the position that different countries have towards Russia and uh, to the degree of Russian influence that they want. So for instance, obviously the, the Baltics would be uh, much more concerned about a Trump victory uh, and a kind of a, the warm relationship that Putin enjoys uh, with Trump. Um, on the other hand, in Southeastern Europe, in in the Balkans, uh, for instance, in Serbia, um, it's the other way around. Um, and in fact, a Trump victory may be a kind of simplify, um, simplify the geopolitical situation because uh, typically the Russians uh, have um, enjoyed uh, significant influence in the Balkans. Um, so the geopolitical ramification, the foreign policy ramification of the um, result of the of the election of the US elections are, for Europe um, are very important. The one thing I also want to underscore is that it was the, to me, the most problematic issue is that the European far right leaders are the ones who have very quickly um, uh, said and very, you know, very, have been very vocal about saying that uh, the election may be rigged. They have really echoed. Uh, the comments that President Trump made um, um, last night and, and earlier today. Um, so for instance, Matteo Silvini of Italy's far right league um, has mentioned that Marine Le Pen of uh, the national rally, uh, the former Front National has also mentioned this. So uh, I think there is, as a comparativist and somebody who studies political parties uh, in Europe, my concern is that um, the populist and the far right uh, parties in Europe uh, would um, um, uh, are, would feel encouraged by a Trump victory in the United States, uh, for sure. The other thing that I'm noticing, uh, just looking at the electoral map, and again, as somebody who teaches comparative politics and democratization and state formation and nation building, um, I see this striking division between the rural and the urban areas. Um, and we see this similar kind of division in European elections as well. Um, so uh, the question is how to bridge that divide, uh, because clearly it's it's a matter of um, socioeconomic division, but also of um, this ideational. Um, uh, essentially, we we have in a country, but uh, people living in two different realities, two different worlds. So no matter who becomes elected, it would be really uh, important. Uh, and it would be a, a task and a very difficult task, I think, to try to uh, bridge the divide. Um, and then I have another comment about the, po the potential of electoral system reform. Uh, but I'm going to leave that um, for the Q&A session. As you know, as someone who studies electoral system reform in Western Europe, I have some interesting, uh, you know, observations about this. But uh, you know, the kind of echoing off of some of the other comments of what, what are we going to, you know, if a huge portion of the country feels underrepresented, um, is there room there for electoral? Uh, system reform, reform of the electoral college, and under what conditions can we see this happening? And I'm just going to pause here.
I've already got a, a question about that in the chat, uh, Nina. So you can yeah. uh, you can you can get to it in just a second. Uh, but first, uh, Professor Burnett responded to my my impromptu question. But uh, Greg, go ahead. Um. Yeah. I, so I, I think this is sort of an odd election, and I don't know exactly what to say. It does look like Biden is on a path to win the White House, but that Republicans seem increasingly likely to hold the Senate. Um, and let me just point to some other weirdness that I think is important to keep in mind about kind of the fact that voters are not all that ideological sometimes and that we sometimes make assumptions about voters and, and maybe overstate some of the divisions in the country. So um, Florida went Republican last night, but voted to raise the minimum wage to $15. California voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden for president, but declined to reinstate affirmative action. Those are votes that are not explainable uh, by kind of party identification. They're exactly the opposite of what you would expect. South Dakota, people in South Dakota and people in Montana can ease their stress of the election by smoking marijuana because they just legalized it. Those are red conservative states, right? Um, and so, you know, there's some kind of the uh, Donald Trump appears to have done better with uh, Latino voters, certainly in Florida, but maybe elsewhere um, than he did in 2016. And that, I think, has caused some people to maybe scratch their heads. I, there's a lot of strangeness here. Um, it's an odd election and it, it occurs in an odd year where there is so much upheaval COVID, the economy, race relations, and, and social and civic unrest. I, I don't know exactly what to make of all this, except to say that this remains a kind of closely divided country, although I'm not convinced that the broader set of Americans have these kind of highly set ideological preferences on issues. I think there's a kind of malleability here that we don't want to, uh, or fluidity that we don't want to miss. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that because I want to save time for questions. But I think I think it's a, it was sort of an odd night. Yeah, it, it, I think that's exactly right. There are a lot of uh, a lot of outcomes that that are just sort of head scratchers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think one question that I, that has to be asked of you guys uh, is is to to help us think a little bit about what could come next, right? It seems out of all the possible scenarios one candidate declaring victory and the other candidate conceding uh, over the next uh, uh, few weeks seems the most far-fetched, uh, right? So what, what do we think could, uh, could, what are some scenarios that could play out if this, for instance, gets to the court, if we have a prolonged, uh, and I, by no means am I suggesting we should go through everything, but, but maybe at this point, what are some signs that we might be moving uh, in, in, in one of those kinds of directions? I'll, I'll just, maybe I can just say briefly, I, I'm a little skeptical of this like, rush to think that this is going to end up in weeks of messy litigation. I, I don't actually think that the similarities to 2000 are clear at all that, that I see some people making. 2000 came down to one single state and a few hundred votes. Uh, the margins we have right now are Joe Biden by 20,000 in Wisconsin. That is not any, I mean, the Trump camp is saying they want to recount in Wisconsin. They can have at it. There's, there's not, it's not going to change 20,000 votes. Last time a recount in Wisconsin changed 131 votes. Um, and so they're just, I mean, Michigan's margin seems to be even larger than that. Um, there are, in other words, multiple states and the margins seem a magnitude, uh, an order of magnitude or three or four larger than what we had in 2000. So I, I'm, I'm a little more skeptical. I'd be interested if my colleagues agree or disagree with me on this. I'm a little more skeptical that this is gonna be a legal mess. The president could make it a kind of rhetorical mess by claiming voter fraud and the kind of things that he seemed to start doing, I think, very dismayingly last night around three in the morning. Um, but, you know, on, on the legal side of things, I, I'm not convinced that, that we're going we're gonna to get there. The margins and the number of states might just be different than we've had in, in for instance, 2000, which is what I see a lot of people kind of talking about, right? I completely agree with Greg. I don't think the courts are going to play a, a terribly significant role uh, in, in this process. I think the magnitudes, as Greg alludes to, of the votes are such that, uh, uh, you know, there can be recounts and there will be questions about which ballots are counted and which aren't, but they're not going to ultimately 
be significant enough to affect the outcome of, of the election. And I think you've also got a court uh, that doesn't want another Bush v. Gore. They don't want to be perceived as calling the election, uh, especially when court packing was an issue. Uh, and uh, with a potential Biden presidency, I think they, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine them stepping in in any kind of decisive way. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree as well. Uh, I, I think a couple of the key differences here from 2000, you know, in 2000, we had a Supreme Court stepping in to stop a state ordered recount. Um, the idea that a court, you know, probably at the state level, but certainly that a federal court would step in and stop the first time a state is counting ballots, it seems extremely far fetched. Um, you know, this was the Supreme Court stepped in in 2000. We were, we were a month into this thing. And, and as we look at the totals that we have, um, if Trump is, is already down and these votes have already been counted, um, you're not going to have any judge, you know, ordering to uncount votes that have already been added to the total. That seems extremely unrealistic as well. Um, so it just doesn't, I, I agree that Trump has, has a fruitful rhetorical path ahead of him for, for kind of building support as, as what may end up being like a martyr. Uh, but, but the idea that we're actually going to, to change the vote count seems, I don't, I don't think courts are going to do that. No, I, I think that builds upon and, and creates, I think, two issues that do come forward. One is that I, I do think Greg and Sam are actually absolutely right, and Don as well, about that this does create some opportunity for the Trump uh, campaign to put forward a rhetorical strategy to contest the election and maybe set up uh, what's going to happen with the GOP in the future right. so that it could create the possibility of them trying to claim that they're the mantle of democracy and have the ability to actually come in with also a potential Trump run in 2024 as something that can actually spiral out of this. But there's also the other side of the issue of this because this is not a landslide. This is not a repudiation of uh, Trumpism. It is not a situation where we can say the GOP is roundly routed out of government. It is a situation showing that the divisions in our country are enough that we're not actually sure what the real message that we can actually claim out of this. And the fact that all of us are really actually looking at this and scratching our heads at some of the impact of the voting last night does suggest there's a lot of mixed messages in this. So really reading the tea leaves to pull one single message out of this means that as an impact, the lack of a landslide, the lack of a clear victor, the lack of a party actually coming through as being strong really kind of mixes it up more than it does actually tell us really what direction the country is going to go. And either president, whichever one actually is you know, settled in the end, isn't going to have a mandate. So that in of itself means they're going to have to figure out ways of trying to govern in such a way, despite the fact that they lack that particular substance they would have for the backing of a public to propel them forward. So that's going to shape a lot of the things I think that are going to go forward. Um, I know this doesn't get at the question of what's going to happen if it gets messy in terms of the, you know, the judicial side of things, if it's going to the court or anything like that. But I think the very act of going to the court may actually make both of those type of uh, issues a little bit clearer as we move forward. Thank you. I, 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 that's that's we're leaving, uh, you know, to 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 a large sense that that we're not going to be seeing this sort of dueled out in the court. I think that that leads in into some uh, dangerous directions. But uh, boy, Trump twenty four, Clayton. I hadn't uh, I hadn't thought I'd hear that today, but there it is. Um, but I want to get to questions uh, in just a second. So in the audience, I hope you guys are turning them up. Uh, but but first, I want to turn to Jake Molesky, who's uh, who's on the ground uh, in in Pennsylvania, uh, doing some work with the Biden campaign. Jake, uh, what what can you tell us about what's happening there? Yeah, so um, like you said, I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm not only just in Pennsylvania. I'm in Joe's hometown of Scranton, in Lackawanna County, in northeastern Pennsylvania, which was crucial for Donald Trump um, winning the election in 2016. So I had been volunteering both with my local Democratic Party, the state Democratic Party, directly with the Biden-Harris campaign um, leading up to the election. And then yesterday I worked as a voter protection agent with the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. So I was a poll watcher. Um, and let me say that turnout here was incredibly high um, on a scene in this city. Uh, the one precinct that I was working at, we believe, may reach 95% turnout once all absentee ballots are counted. The other precinct that we worked will reach at least 85% turnout. So turnout is there. Um, absentee ballots are being counted. It's insane to watch how once these absentee ballots are being counted, 
how quickly the race changes. So like I said, I worked as a poll watcher. So I was able to, I was the first one to know that in-person um, counts from the two precincts I worked. In the one precinct, it was tied. Um, or no, I'm sorry, it wasn't tied. Uh, Donald Trump won that precinct by about three votes. And the other precinct, um, Donald Trump won by about 10 votes. Once the absentee um, ballots were included and the mail-in ballots were included, Joe Biden won both of those by at least 65%. So absentee ballots in Pennsylvania, when they are counted and how they are counted, absolutely will be crucial in this election because a lot of our outstanding ballots in Pennsylvania are in Philadelphia County, are in Allegheny County, um, are in swing counties like mine where we're seeing that these mail-in ballots are coming in and the estimates have been so far so good as to what percentage goes to which party from the mail-in ballots. And they are breaking about 70 to 80% for Democrats. So um, it's gonna be an interesting next couple of days pending um, how many are returned before Friday, uh, whether that stands in the courts. Um, and we're gonna have a fun time of counting. Also a fun fact, my county was the first county in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to report their total um, both in-person and absentee slash mail-in results. So we are very proud here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jake. And, and you know, I think that's a pretty graphic uh, uh, illustration. Uh, Professor Stoddard, I, I don't wanna uh, speak for you, but when Professor Stoddard says there's uh, every reason to believe that that looks like Biden has this uh, in the bag, it's, it's not because of polls, it's because of just this kind of thing that the outstanding ending ballots, uh, especially the absentee ballots, do seem like they're going to break for Democrats on, on the whole. So uh, that I, I think that's a perfect illustration of that. Uh, I've got I got our first question uh, from a self-identified shy Trump voter. Sorry, so let me, I just want to make sure I'm reading it right. Uh, okay. Uh, Democrats kept their majority in the House, but Republicans appeared to do better than Democrats hoped for. Uh, certainly a big part of the story of the night. Uh, do you think that the Republicans will flip the House in 2022? Uh, maybe too early to, to make definitive predictions about that, but what do you think? Is What does this uh, suggest about where Republicans are going over the next couple of years? If I had to guess, I would say yes. Uh, I think that the Democrats are in a really precarious position right now, as, as Clayton was suggesting. Um, Biden, I, I'm looking at Biden, uh, we don't know about Pennsylvania. Right, um, it'll probably be one of the later ones that we know, but but if Biden just pulls off Michigan and Wisconsin and Arizona and Nevada, um, he's gonna have 270 votes exactly. That is just about the smallest mandate you could possibly have. Um, mean, so then he's gonna go in um, with a Republican Senate. Um, and so it's gonna be incredibly hard for him to put forth to, to pass any agenda, but you know, more broadly, um, Biden didn't really run on any agenda. And so when voters vote for you without any expectation about any particular thing that you're planning on doing for them in the first place, what that leads to is lots of people having lots of wildly different expectations of, of basically like what they've been promised. Um, and that's just a really risky position for any president to be in, not only an inability to, to fulfill any kind, to make any kind of substantive policy change that voters are gonna to respond to, but, but lots of voters having very different expectations about what types of policy they're expecting in the first place. Um, yeah, I, I think this sets up uh, Democrats for a likely loss, um, you know, assuming Joe Biden is president, um, for, for a likely loss in, in 2022. So it's, it's uh, they've got a tough path to forge, for sure. Yeah, I agree with Sam. I, I, I think that uh, it, probably one of the more surprising results of last night was the fact that Republicans actually did pick up House seats, which had not uh, been predicted. <sighs> And uh, some of that, I think, has to do with uh, Nancy Pelosi and the perception that she was unwilling to uh, fashion a deal uh, with uh, Trump to give essentially Trump possibly a political win just before the election. Uh, and so uh, there were some surprising uh, uh, results where Republicans who were not favored to win districts uh, did come back and, and win those districts. And uh, I, I expect Nancy Pelosi will still be the leader of the House. and, and uh, until there's a kind of shakeup over on the Democratic side, I can't, I think they're gonna be uh, in trouble running in 
in 2022. Certainly seems to raise questions about the strategy of running as anti-Trump rather than running on a, on a very clearly articulated agenda. Right. Right. Uh, gr grateful now to be joined by Professor Vicki Langer. Uh, thanks for, for coming right after class. Uh, I want to make sure we get uh, our full panel a chance to, to share their impressions. So uh, Vicki, Professor Langer, uh, what do you think? Well, thank you for having me. I apologize for coming late. And I obviously don't have the value or the benefit of having heard my colleagues' comments. So I just wanted to raise like a bigger question. And I don't know if that'll elicit any questions, but as a comparativist who studies the Middle East and works primarily on non-Western countries, primarily non-Western democracies, uh, we watch a lot of elections and we see how elections are conducted in other places. And I think there are a couple of alarm bells for me that precede this election, but whose implications were seen kind of amplified in this particular election. So I don't mean to say that these, this is the first time we've seen them, but we've seen their effects amplified this time. So I was struck by the fact, for example, when I believe it was um, former First Lady Michelle Obama who talked at the convention about the need to for folks to you know have their tennis shoes on and bring their lunch and be prepared to stand in line for a long time to vote, right? And we all know, I think many of us voted in person, we all have experienced that the fact that we have COVID and we can't safely be in a building is gonna make electing people take longer. But the shameful reality is for many, many years, many election cycles, especially in, in urban cities, we see people in very long lines, having to wait in line. That's not something you see in Western wealthy democracies and there's no excuse for it. I mean, there's really no reason why that outside of COVID, we have to be in a situation where large voting areas, uh, you know, it takes five, 10 hours to vote. That's something that could be easily fixed. And it's not something you see in countries that we compare ourselves to, you know, equally wealthy, long-standing democracies. Another question is questions of voter suppression. And one that's really been on my mind a lot before and during the election is Florida. So many of the people who are listening today will know that I wanna say about 2016, the people in the state passed a referendum to reverse the longstanding policy in Florida that people who had been convicted of felony convictions and spent time in prison, uh, even after they, were, after they finished their time, were not able to get their voting rights reinstated, except if they went individually in front of the governor and made a plea for them to have that done. So around 2016, I'm not sure of the exact year, the state of Florida, over with about 65% of the people who voted in the referendum, voted basically to say that all of the existing fines that people had to pay, in addition to having been released from jail so that they could requalify themselves to vote, um, that law was gotten rid of. So people who might have outstanding fines could, could still vote. Then the legislature overturned the results of the referendum. And of course it went to court and then the lower court said that this is it's not legal to have people who have finished their felony convictions not be allowed to vote because they may be too poor to pay existing fines it was likened to a poll tax then the appeals court overturned that but what's interesting to note is before my last class so this may be outdated but when i last checked in at about 245 and I'm sure this is outdated, but at about 245, the gap in Florida, which we know has been called for President Trump, was about 375,000 people, the gap, the, the, the gap by which Trump, or the margin by which Trump was ahead of Biden in Florida at that time, about three hours ago, was about 375,000 voters. And when the ACLU and other voting rights organizations went to court earlier this year, and unsuccessfully argued in the appeals court that this was in fact a poll tax on likely voters, they argued that as many as 774,000 people fell into that category. So potentially that is larger than the margin between um, President Trump and, and wanting to be President Biden. So I think there needs to be, from as a comparativist, these continued attempts to kind of keep people um, from having rights to vote particularly when it is assumed and pr probably rightly so that they will be disproportionately in favor of one party is something that a comparativist, I think, who has experience with other non-democratic countries or democratic countries that have backslid to partially free status sees with quite a bit of alarm. Thank you, Vicki. Good to, to put a finer point on, on this kind of general question about voter suppression and, 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 and how our electoral system uh, does or doesn't work. Uh, we have a question from Professor Landy uh, along these same lines. Uh, Tom, you want to um, jump in? Thanks. So I'm just uh, curious, and maybe um, even just a raise of hands from the panelists, and then if anyone wants to ask in detail. But given that we've, what we've seen in the last couple of elections, 
How many of you would support a constitutional amendment to eliminate the Electoral College and move on to direct election based on a uh, national majority? Am I the only one? I'm the only one I can see. I'm wishing it, yeah. it, 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 it is oh, definitely yeah. it, it's definitely not a majority. Uh, I mean, political scientists love uh, con contra con contraptions of voting, so uh, this is this is definitely uh, a, a difficult audience. Can I can I uh, alter that? What, what, you know, yeah. I, I kind of think what's going on in Maine and, and Nebraska, where the electoral vote is not a winner take all, but is is split up uh, along congressional districts. Uh, as well as as a statewide, uh, how many of you feel like that? Uh, if we move to a model like that, uh, broader across the nation, that that would be a solid approval. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, Nina, uh, you you wanted to talk about the electoral college earlier. What do you, what do you what do you think? So, as someone who has studied um, adoption of proportional representation in Western Europe from a historical perspective. Um, I, I know that um, you know what uh, what is the one factor that um, urges a shift towards uh, towards a more proportional system, and uh, and there are actually two factors that uh, we have in you know in mind. But one of them is structural, and uh, what we do know is that you need to have one party that is and the voters supporters of one party that are consistently year after year, election after election. Um, feel underrepresented or excluded from the decision-making process. And then those, um, uh, those voters and that party could start, um, could start um, uh, advocating for reform. Uh, but even then the other side that benefits uh, from the existing system has every incentive to preserve it. Right. So typically it is really difficult, even in the Western European context, has been very difficult to switch into uh, uh, to, uh, to change the electoral system. Um, and one factor that plays a big role would be um, the opponents, uh, the proponents of the change, the, those who advocate for change would have to apply some sort of extra institutional pressure and that extra institutional pressure has to be quite high. So long story short, I do not think that um, it is any, that I do not think that it is likely that the American Electoral College will transition into something more proportional. I know that there, uh, this, this issue has been brought up election after election and the, the Republican party had brought, brought it up um, after 2012. Um, but I do not think that this is very likely to happen because what we know is that electoral systems typically um, are very stable and pending, um, pen, pending like consistent exclusion of one large se segment of society from the policy decision uh, for a prolonged period of time um, and without this intense um, extra institutional pressure, I do not think that uh, something like this is likely. Um, I'll just uh, jump in real quick. I was supposed to monitor ongoing developments throughout this. I just want to say ABC News uh, and maybe some other outlets have called Michigan for Joe Biden, um, which would put him at 253 electoral votes and put him closer to winning. Not unexpected, but significant. And the margin is something like 65,000 votes, which would be even outside of any kind of recount potential, it would appear. Um, you heard it here fo first, folks. Uh, <laughs> Don, you want to jump in about the electric bill? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with Nina that I don't think any kind of fundamental change towards a more European type proportional representation is in the works in American politics. Uh, I go further and argue that it actually is desirable. Our, our current system is preferable. Uh, that is, uh, by our current system, I mean, let me slightly qualify that. We've always had sort of two big tent parties. Um, and um, and, why, and I think there's something salutary about that, that it, it vitalizes the, the center in American politics. Um, in response to some of my colleagues who have been more pessimistic about uh, the outcome of this election, uh, I, I would simply note that um, actually, the, I, I think this, uh, uh, this election constitutes a kind of move back 
towards the, the two parties more gravitating uh, towards the center. I think often to understand uh, political events, one has to understand counterfactuals or hypotheticals. Uh, so here, two things to keep in mind, if Bernie Sanders had won the Democratic nomination, our two political parties would be much more polarized. Um, the two nation phenomena that Maria talked about, I think would have been accentuated. If it turned, uh, so the nomination of Biden was a, a move to the center in the Democratic Party. And if Biden now wins the presidential election, which again, I think is increasingly likely, um, that fortifies the center in the Democratic Party against the progressive left. Uh, had Biden lost, the progressive left and certainly by 2024 would be coming back and saying, you see, we can't win elections through the center. We've got to go much more to the left. And um, so I think uh, this, this election could have ended up accentuating the two nation phenomena. In fact, it's done the opposite. I have a question from Robert Horowitz. Uh, uh, Robert. So I was just curious, it's sort of an open question. Do you guys expect to see uh, obstruction in the Senate if slash when Biden wins the presidency? Uh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, I think that if Republicans, it's it's worth thinking about, you know, if Republicans hold the Senate and Biden is president, that means Biden's going to have a tougher time. So start with judicial appointments, tougher time appointing judges to either Supreme Court vacancies that may occur or lower court vacancies. And Donald Trump has has had a lot of appointees to the courts in his time. So that would really slow Biden down and kind of offsetting some of that rightward shift on the courts. Um, it, it probably means that things like uh, obviously like the Green New Deal and Medicare for all, which I'm not sure we're on the table, even with the Democrat majority in the Senate, unless it was very large, but, but now we're off the table. Um, but, you know, I do think there will be pressure for compromise on some kind of COVID related relief package now. Um, so, so that's something I think you could get legislation on that gets some bipartisan buy-in. And the other thing I guess I would just say is there are a lot of things that Biden can either do or undo via executive action um, that are worth thinking about. Uh, many of Donald Trump's policies on immigration that were done by executive order, um, uh, rejoining the Paris Climate Accords, you know, things that don't require going through Congress to do. Um, and there may be, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of other examples. Um, there are probably lawyers working on this right now, figuring out what, what, can, what can a President Biden do uh, without Congress, right? Let me, let me ask it another way. So Biden served 30 plus years in the Senate. Um, he uh, made reaching across the aisle such a big part of his selling point that it got him in trouble back during the primaries for, for saying that he worked with uh, segregationist senators back in the, back in the day. Uh, are, are these the kinds of experience that would enable a president uh, to work more closely with the leader of a legislative opposition party? I'm just not sure that that's the relevant factor. Um, I think that certainly McConnell and, and you know Republicans had a lot of success with an oppositional agenda during the Obama administration. Um, that 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 got them as far as as controlling the whole government a few years later. There, there's just no reason to to switch up that strategy and 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 you know allow Joe Biden to be painted as a bipartisan, even though I know that's the way he sees himself and, and that he's going to be striving for that. Um, it, it's you know, it's been made pretty clear in the modern polarized era that it, it takes two to tango and it's really easy to blame it on the other side when you refuse. So uh, I, I just don't think there's any, you know, again, looking at 2022, um, there's there's no incentive for, for Republicans to give Biden any type of victory like that. Maria. Well, then I have to push the more optimistic vision of my colleagues aside again, because if the if some of us interpreted it as moving towards the center because Biden was such a choice, um, the first question is, where's the moving towards the center from the part of the Republican uh, party? And if the Republican party is not going to come to the center in order to negotiate, then it's going to create obstacles and we will continue towards the situation of obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, which in fact generates further polarization and the notion that in, in a global society, what the Democratic Party did by moving to the center is to uh, 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 prevent the, the radicalization of the left, 
There's nothing that the left of the Democratic Party can propose that is any kind of radicalization for global um, standards. So we're not coming to the center by uh, choosing Biden. We're not coming to the center by splitting the government with a Republican Senate. We're not creating conditions for a dialogue in a presidential system. I don't really see how that which I call these two nations would find avenues and institutions to really accommodate a, a common vision in the current scenario. Sorry. An optimist. Uh, can an optimist respond? <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, the fact that Joe Biden is going to be a single term president. Uh, that uh, I, I can't really foresee him at his age uh, running again in 2024, assuming again he does become president, obviously. But um, and uh, so that I think uh, it gives him uh, an incentive to uh, it, it gives Republicans less incentive to be obstructive. Uh, the fact that Trump, if he does go down to defeat, uh, that that will, I think, uh, uh, you know, empower more moderate voices in the Republican Party. So I think there are reasonable grounds for thinking uh, that some work across the aisles is going to be possible in the next four years. Obviously, we're speculating at this point. Uh, it depends on the governing strategy that is embraced by Biden, but that somehow if Biden were to reach across the aisle, that the cards are, you know, foreordained, that is foreordained that the Republicans are acting, are going to act as obstructionists doesn't seem to me to be justifiable. You know, I, I think the interesting question, and, and I want to make sure we're, we're we keep mindful of the time, because I, I, I imagine many of us are working on very little sleep, and, and a long Zoom meeting is not a good solution for that. Uh, but but uh, one thought I have from this is, what is it? What would it take for centrism to emerge uh, again now as as an active political force? What are some uh, some of the concrete things you would you would expect to see? I'm not sure I'm seeing many of those things in this election result. Uh, just just for that, but uh, I want to I want to get the last question, which I think maybe we can answer uh, in sort of a. a, a, a fairly quick uh, fashion from, from Annie Rogers. Uh, Georgia is still waiting for mail-ins in, in very democratic districts. What are your thoughts of the, the thoughts of the panel uh, on the probability of Georgia flipping? Uh, boy, I, I was saying all night last night, there's no way Georgia's going for a, for a Democrat. Uh, and yet here we are, that's a, that's a good question. Panel, what do you guys? I think it's a coin flip. Yeah, I'm not looking at the data, but I always thought that Biden's chances in Georgia were probably better than Florida, just the way the two states have changed so much demographically. Um, you know, Georgia is increasingly, you know, a lot of those voters are just transplanted West Coast and East Coasters. Um, not that Georgia is an East Coast, but Northeast. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I have no idea what the numbers look like right now, but I always thought the demographics made sense. I mean, I think the New York Times is really good um, kind of precinct level, county level stuff on North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. They kind of focused on those three. And if anybody was watching those needles last night um, and some of the really intricate breakdowns and the Times needle right now on Georgia is just about in the middle or slightly leaning Biden. And so um, I think I think they've been pretty darn good. So, so yeah, it looks to me like it's pretty gonna be really close be really close. You know, I, I grew up near Georgia. I went to school with a lot of people from Georgia. And the joke we used to always make is that everybody from Georgia said they were from Atlanta, when actually very few people uh, were actually from Atlanta. Uh, and I think that that's uh, not, not the, I'm very few of the people I went to college with. Uh, there are obviously lots of people in, in Atlanta. Uh, the point being um, that this is not, uh, it's not South Carolina, it's not Tennessee, it's not Alabama. It's a, it's, it's a very, as, as uh, Professor Stoddard points out, uh, the place where a lot of people from other places move to. Um, so it's a different, uh, different kind of thing. Uh, let me thank the panelists, guys. This has been, uh, this has been great. Uh, usually we get to stand around the, the political science hallway and have these kind of conversations informally. Sorry, we can't do that uh, these days, but uh, thanks for sh sharing some time. And uh, I'll just say to everybody, good night, get a good night's rest, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear more in the morning.